the Republican members that are here today, what have you all done to help Joe Biden in this okay, year okay. that Joe waited for? All right, so that's a ridiculous and silly question. I want to commend you for being well, the media and telling a Democrat policy. So let me ask you something. Come on, man, that's been going on for 20 years. Yeah, okay, really. okay, hey, let, 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 me, let me ask you something. Let me ask threat. you something. What rate of illegal immigration did we have in 2020? But you have Do you know been, anything? I asked you a question. How long have you been in office? Do you know anything? How long have you been in office? I've been in office 11 years yeah, now. And this has been okay. the count during multiple administrations. It, except you're wrong. Okay, you don't get to argue with me. You asked your question. You, you asked your question. You don't get. You want to hold a press conference? You can do it over there. You have How are you? If you want to hold a press conference? You can do it over there. That's <laughs> Ted Cruz on the board of Mexico on his latest safari. You can tell because he's dressed up and all of drab like a tough guy. But you can tell he's not that tough too because he doesn't take questions very well, does he? You know, he loves to do his podcast with his friend well, five days a week, I think now. But he sure doesn't like actually answering questions of reporters and constituents about the policies that he's failed to pass. 11 years in the Senate and little to show for it. Well, he's got real competition this time. Last cycle, he only beat Beto O'Rourke by about three points. Now he's got Colin Allred, congressman from Texas, running against him and coming on strong. Newest polling from a GOP firm shows him the dead heat just a few months from the primary and even uh, maybe nine months from the actual election. So I really want to talk to Colin a little bit, catch up with him, find out why he's in this race, what his priorities are, put him in the hot seat with FP Wellman. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. I'm excited to talk to him. Congressman, man, welcome to the show. Welcome to the talk. I appreciate you being joining us in the hot seat today. Yeah, thanks so much, Fred. You know, I opened with a video of Ted. You saw Ted Cruz being beaten up by reporters during his most recent safari at the border. Now he's producing his ridiculously smarmy podcast five times a week uh, while flogging his latest book. You know, on top of what we're speaking, you know, just a week after the, I mean, I think it's what, it's a week now since the third anniversary of one that the great ice storm in Texas when he fled mm -hmm. to Cancun. I mean, uh, it, it, have people had enough of mine? Is that what drove you to run this time, sir? Yeah, well, I, I felt really strong. I'm a fourth generation Texan. I was born yeah. and raised in Dallas uh, by a single mom who was a public school teacher. My family's from Brownsville. I went to Bailey where I was captain of the football team. I mean, I know who we are as Texans. And I felt incredibly strongly this guy just doesn't represent us uh, and that we couldn't afford six more years of him podcasting instead of trying to help folks, of him going to our border communities and using them as a place just to point out problems, but then going to D.C. and taking down efforts to try and actually solve those problems. You know, of him being, I think, somebody who, as you said, uh, doesn't care about the 30 million folks he represents. And that's how you're yeah. able to go on vacation when we're freezing in the dark and when folks need you to actually help them. Yeah, and, and Texans, you know, deserve representation. It's been, a, been one of our biggest frustrations with the, the MAGA movement, which Ted is all signed in for, is that they're just there for themselves to, to get those TV spots and those podcasts, aren't they? Yeah, and also, as you said, I mean, he's also got a book to sell. Uh, so there's a there's a grift here, you know, where you, you podcast three or four or five times a week telling folks all the things they should be angry about. And then you say, oh, go buy my book. Uh, when that's not actually the job, right, as you and I both know, uh, a United States senator who has a lot of things they could spend their time on, like trying yeah. to better the lives of their constituents, like trying to solve problems, like trying to, you know, be somebody who that folks can feel like is actually working for them every single day instead of trying to work for themselves. And that, I think, has really filtered down uh, that Texans understand that Ted Cruz is only looking out for himself. And I hope that they'll understand over the course of this campaign uh, that I'm somebody who really cares about all of us, that I've been a very bipartisan member of Congress uh, that, you know, I, I come to this from perspective uh, of kind of a team athlete uh, where I, I think we need to come together to get things done. And when you're raised by a single mom, you don't really have time for theoretical ideas. So I want to actually deliver for Texans. We know Ted Cruz has had 12 years of showing that he can't do that. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. You know, I think a lot often I'm a big Ted Lasso fan. And uh, I remember the famous the famous scene in the early season when he's talking to Jamie Tart, if you know that the star, and he goes, you know, you're a great player. You're one of the best in the world. You're fantastic and uh, one of the best. But it seems like you forget that out there you're one of 11, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I think your background tells you, you know, what it's like yeah. to be part of a team and that that matters. Yeah. Well, you know, he's, he's always say you want to go fast, go by yourself. You want to go far, go together, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and if you want to actually get things done. Uh, in a legislative body, which is what the United States Senate is, you have to be somebody who, number one, isn't you know disliked by all of your colleagues, uh, but also uh, that folks feel like they can trust you and that you can form these kind of bonds and coalitions. And they're sometimes unusual. I mean, the way I got a new VA hospital in my district was by working with some very conservative Republicans in my area, the Trump yeah. administration, the actual hospital itself, local leaders uh, to try and get a recently abandoned hospital donated to the VA. It took about a year of effort, uh, but it was only possible because of bipartisanship and because folks could trust me. 
That's something yeah. that Ted Cruz has never shown any interest in doing. In fact, he would never be able to roll up his sleeves to get something done like that. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. And as a veteran, thank you. I mean, it matters. And the and VA has come so service. far. Yeah. You know, well, it's the best I can do. Now, you've been in Congress for a while. You've been since the fallout from the Dobbs decision has unfolded. Texas yeah. has enacted some of the strictest anti-abortion laws in the country. Now, this Alabama fetal personhood ruling has sent shockwaves across the country. And that's I'm cool. reading a lot of reports saying Texas could be next in this battle. You know, uh, people are, I read an article today that people, uh, couples in Texas are trying to get their frozen embryos out of the state uh, before they get caught in this mess. I mean, they're never going to stop, are they? No, and it's it's a tragedy, honestly, what's happening in Texas. We are experiencing what a near total ban on abortion looks like, uh, which is that, according to the Houston Chronicle, 26,000 Texas women have given birth to their rapist child uh, since uh, Dobbs uh, came down. We have stories like you know Kate Cox, a mother of two, who has a much wanted third pregnancy. She has to go to the emergency room four times. She gets the news that we all hope we don't get when we're going through you know these delicate pregnancies that the you know the baby's not going to make it and it's a risk to her health. Her doctor says she needs a medically necessary abortion. And her state says you can't do it here. In fact, if you they don't just say that. They say we're going to prosecute you, your doctor, your hospital. We have counties saying you can't drive through the county if you're going to yeah. use the roads to access an abortion. And I've been asking myself, how are they going to enforce that? We're going to start pulling women over and asking them, what's the nature of your travel, ma'am? I mean, Texans believe in freedom, and this is not it. Uh, and the only way we can restore this right is at the federal level. Uh, I have voted in the House to pass the Women's Health Protection Act. We've gotten it through the House. We have not been able to get it through the Senate. Uh, when I'm in the United States Senate, we will. And we'll restore this right for Texas women, for Alabama women, for women all across this country. So you want to worry about uh, in, in vitro fertilization or anything else. We can go back to having a sane policy around reproductive rights. Well, uh, it, it's it's I live in Missouri myself, and it's it's horrifying the stories you're hearing and the and the damage it does to a, a state, and it does it to its economy too. I mean, we've seen a flood of 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 businesses. You've I've seen reports where uh, companies don't want to move to Texas now. Yeah. We're even talking about military members avoiding service at bases in Texas. And you have a lot of military in your state. Obviously, I've been to Fort, uh, you know, they've been down there quite a few times. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so the economy is going to be affected with this. You know, we, we, we've got a booming economy right now, right? And and these bans will hurt that. I mean, and, and the economy is something, you know, we're, we've been doing. We're going to build on that, I hope. That's, I mean, what's your position on where we're going? Are we on the right track economically, yeah. you think? Yeah. Well, I come from a family where, you know, you kind of swipe the debit card and you say a little prayer, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, you know, we don't we don't pay our teachers enough in Texas. And my, my mom was a public school teacher. And, uh, you know, so we, we struggled growing up. And so I, I am... Uh, completely uh, understanding of that any kind of increase in prices, I know exactly who that hits. And it doesn't hit, you know, the folks who, uh, you know, are at the top, right? It's the folks who every single penny counts. Because uh, I, I do remember, you know, we'd say we'd come to the line and say, well, we got to take a few things out. We, we actually went over what we know we could spend this week, right? Uh, and, and so I, that's why I've always been so focused on growing the economy and lowering costs. And that's something that I, where I, I think completely differ with, you know, Ted Cruz on. Because uh, for for example, you know, we tried to cap, uh, we we did cap the cost of insulin for folks on Medicare at thirty five bucks a month. We try to do it for everyone, because one in four Americans are rationing their insulin. And as you know, we use the word rationing, but that really shouldn't be called that. It should be called they're not taking the medicine they need to survive. Yeah. Uh, and, and so we're trying to to cap that cost, lower those costs for folks all across the country, and we weren't able to because folks like Ted Cruz stopped us, right? And when we're trying to lower the cost of childcare, if you're gonna, you know take away uh, reproductive rights, take away access to an abortion, then you at least think that you would then try to control and lower costs for child care, maybe have universal pre-K, you know, have uh, paid family leave, try and make it easier for families to get ahead. I've got a three and five-year-old, my wife and I do. Uh, mm -hmm. This is an incredibly difficult period, uh, this kind of stretch in those early years for families. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, Ted Cruz opposes all of those efforts. Uh, whereas, you know, I was the first member of Congress to ever take paternity leave. I want to make sure that we make paid family leave available to everyone, that we have universal pre-K, that we allow you to have those early years have a chance to build those kind of ladders of opportunity that will allow maybe some other kid out there who's raised by a single mom to play in the NFL like I did, become a civil rights lawyer like I did, and maybe run for Congress or Senate or you know, do whatever they want, whatever their version of the American dream is. Yeah, we, we lift everyone uh, when we all live together. So it's wonderful. You know, last thing I'll talk about is, uh, you know, I'm the son of a Marine. I grew up with guns. I'm I'm a 22-year Army veteran. And obviously, guns are part of my life and my profession. Yeah. We just had that mass shooting in Kansas City at the Super Bowl uh, parade, which you're, I'm sure you were affected by, especially as a former football player. Um, 
you know, it, it just seems like, is, is there a better way forward with guns and, 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 yeah. and, and, and how do we make any improvement on that? Yeah. Well, I think I want to address this as a Texan because uh, to me, and I think you and I both know this, Fred, like, you know, in Texas, we have a culture of what I think of responsible gun ownership. Yeah. And that's what I think we've kind of gotten away from, because that's the one that I grew up with. It wasn't uncommon when I was growing up, when I'd visit my grandmother in Brownsville, which is in South Texas, and, you, and you'd see a truck driving by with a shotgun in the back window, right? Yep. Um, but there was a culture of doing things safely and responsibly. In fact, I went to a camp uh, every summer, a YMCA camp called Camp Brady Spruce at Possum Kingdom Lake in here in Texas, which is a funny name. Uh, and, you know, we had a riflery range. And when I was seven years old, they were teaching us how to, you know, safely handle a rifle. And that's something I learned later in other states is not actually very common to have a, seven, a seven-year-old, uh, you know, a twenty-two <laughs> rifle. Um, but that's the whole idea was that this was going to be responsible about this, right? And we've gotten away from that. And now we're in a place where Texas, unfortunately, uh, you know, we were one of the leading states in terms of these mass uh, you know, killings, mass murders. Uh, and obviously, we had the tragedy uh, in Uvalde. Yeah. Uh, and I'll say this, after that, um, for the first time in 30 years, we did pass some legislation at the federal level to try and reduce gun violence, so the Safer Communities Act. And to his credit, and this is not going to be something that's said very often probably on your show, uh, John <laughs> Cornyn helped us push that through. Uh, John yep. Cornyn did that, and he took a lot of political heat for it. Dead. Ted Cruz voted against it, right? Even after seeing uh, and you know, being present with all those families and knowing the tragedy that occurred. And it was an incredibly modest bill. You know, trying to you know, have increased funding for mental health, increased funding for you know school hardening, closing the boyfriend loophole, allowing states to set up their own red flag laws. P pretty modest. Uh, but we have to build on that now uh, because I refuse to accept that my, you know, almost three and five year old, uh, that they have to grow up in a, in a country where uh, I'm, I'm going to be worried every day we drop them off at school uh, that their school could be next. And so yeah. to me, you and I both know there's some common sense things like universal background checks, limiting high capacity magazines. Raising, raising the age to purchase a semi-automatic rifle. The, ki the, the killer in Uvalde couldn't buy a beer, but he could buy an AR-15. Uh, I mean, that's that's unacceptable. Uh, red flag laws. There's so much that we can do. And all of these have 75, 80, 85% yeah. support you know, from yep. the American people and from Texans. And that's why I want to stress for folks out there is that we can do this consistent with the Second Amendment and with our culture in Texas, but also save lives. Well, that's the key. And that's the job, isn't it? So, yeah. well, I hope you, uh, congratulations on your run. It's going great. I mean, the numbers are looking great. I mean, it, it's still early, got a long fight ahead of you, but, uh, but as you, as people like to joke, right. Uh, everybody, everybody hates Ted Cruz. So, <laughs> you know, but appreciate your time. I know you're back in Washington. You're kicking off the, after the, after the session, you've got to get the government funded. You've got Thank to pass aid government. for Israel and Ukraine. You've got a lot on your plate. Uh, I hope it goes well up there and I hope you keep, get the fight. And, and of course I have to ask the big question, where can people donate? Where can they find out more about your campaign? Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Fred. And thank you for your service uh, to our country. Uh, and, and let me just say, listen, folks, uh, we can win this. This is a great opportunity for us to not only remove, I think, the worst senator uh, in the country, but to elect somebody who really will care about all 30 million Texans uh, here in our state. And so go to ColinAllRed.com and get involved with us, please. There you go. Thanks for your time. Get back in the fight. Thanks for joining me in the hot seat today, sir. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Fred. Great conversation with Congressman Allred as he runs against Ted Cruz. As you can see, just a smart guy with his priorities straight. And that is the, the issue, isn't it? It's working for all of your constituents. And we don't see enough of that today. I hope we see more of it. So thanks for joining me in the, the first hot seat conversation with a the candidate for, uh, uh, for the Senate. There'll be more to come. Follow all of our shows on Democracy with F.P. Wellman. We've we put up new podcasts every week, Friday night at 11 on the Midas Touch Network. Be sure to catch it there. Follow us on our own channel, On Democracy Podcast, on YouTube, and wherever you find your social media. I am Fred Wellman. Thanks for joining us.